too often we see age groups from this burnout not make it to the podium after an early good start. So how many hours of good quality training do you think swimmers 12 to 14 should do a week to ensure they succeed rather than burn out? Swimming is an early um, specialisation sport and really therefore you've got to start very early and very young and build up the core skills and that really means that you've got to commit quite a bit of time and typically uh, boys at that age might be looking at about 12 to 14 hours girls might be even looking at 14 to 16 hours because they develop a wee bit quicker girls. Uh, the important thing is that you will really not reach the top level unless you make that sort of commitment. It's a hell of a commitment. Well, that doesn't stop a lot of people enjoying swimming just for enjoying swimming, but not everybody's going to get to the Olympic Games. There is a very widely held view that the National Masters are seen by the ASA as a cash cow. Please can you explain to the Masters population just what the value of the ASA is to Masters? Jim Boucher. They're certainly not a cash cow. Uh, they actually, if you look at the books, uh, it's roughly money in, money out, and it's pretty neutral in terms of the income to the ASA. Having said that, I think there's massive potential for Masters. What I want to see is more of a Masters festival, and I want to see Masters managing Masters. What I actually find is most Masters, are, frankly, they just turn up, swim, and go away. And it's the same old volunteers who are providing the backbone support. And I think masters need to take more responsibility for their support. And I think if we can create that festival atmosphere um, with lots of fun around the event itself and lots of things to do, I think it would be really exciting. The teaching CPD courses I've attended tend not to include advances that are happening at the elite level. Why is this? If teachers are more aware of how the technique is changing, it would greatly aid their grassroots swimmers. Yvette, easy to swim LTD. There's not much going on in swimming that we, we don't all know about. And very often at the advanced level, what we're doing is slightly adapting the stroke to suit the individual. What we need to do with swimming teachers and swimming coaches is get the basics into them first. Get them to understand what the basic skills are that they need. And then after that, we can start to refine those. So anyone that wants to go on can go on to a level four coaches course and learn about how to adapt. But I think there's a danger in giving them too much information too soon until they've got the basics. It's a bit like doing Laplace transforms before you've learned how to add up, for those who are mathematically minded. Laplace transforms are really hard to do. Adding up's easy. Get that sorted first. What role does online learning for teachers and coaches have to play at the ASA? How will this be achieved? I think online learning is very much the way uh, for the future, not just for swimming, but for all. Um, the ASA is clearly moving with the times by introducing this new website, which will be suitable for uh, candidates, for leisure operators, and people uh, in the aquatic uh, business. Uh, the website is going live from uh, the 1st of October, it will be a place where people can go and actually work out what their aquatic training needs are. They'll be able to book courses uh, and generally manage uh, their training uh, uh, for the future. Uh, I think it's a great uh, innovation and something that will certainly help both the ASA uh, improve the quality of coaching uh, and education out there in the field. The way we look at it is that online training for teachers and coaches means you can do a lot of the work in your own time when you want to do it. And it doesn't mean you've got to turn out on a dark winter's night to go to some terrible um, college and sit there in the dark or in the cold and, and, and listen to a lecture for an hour and a half when you've done a hard day's work. You can sit at home in the warm and do your studying. And then you can come along to the swimming pool and do your practical work. So it's about fitting the learning into your lifestyle. There is a complete lack of understanding by pool managers about what the National Plan for Teaching Swimming is hoping to achieve and no support for teachers who hoped to see it implemented correctly. How can the ASA change this? Joe Barker, Kent. Well, I'm sure uh, some of the pool managers would actually claim they do know uh, what the MPTS is. Uh, but clearly it is, it is something that... Uh, the, the ASA is, is, is committed to uh, in sharing uh, best practice. But it does take time and effort. You can't just do it uh, by just uh, rolling up on the day and thinking it's going to happen. You have to put time and effort into uh, making it work. 
And we found that those people who have invested the time and energy have actually had the, the results therefrom. But there's also uh, an MPTS quick challenge that people can do. Uh, and we found that, funny enough, actually, that that actually reaps uh, some v very quick dividends for people who undertake it. But we do have ASA staff uh, in the field and, and at the centre, and we're here to help. Uh, and so people should contact us if they uh, need any assistance from us. Well, I don't say that there's the lack of understanding. There's probably, I think that's a bit unfair to say, to say the least. I think, I think there are pet places where they don't really understand. But let's just step back and ask ourselves, what is the National Teaching Plan? The National Teaching Plan is a logical plan that says you start here and it, you progress through the, the skills. In other words, you don't start with butterfly. You, you know, that, that's a daft place to start. And we can all understand that. So what do I teach first? What do I do next? What do I do next? And you get the basic skills in. Now that's common sense. And I think what we say with the National Teaching Plan is it's not a rigid plan that you have to follow. You don't have to do breaststroke this week and backstroke next week. You just work through it in a logical way, picking the bits from it that you want. So I think the really important thing is that we've got to get out there and make sure that our partners, the pool operators, really understand the ethos. And we're trying to do that. Still got some way to go. And uh, I guess we'll always have some way to go, but we'll keep working on it. What can be done to get more local diving facilities like Maltby in Rotherham? There are so many areas of the country without any diving facilities at all. Alex Morris. Well, the diving facilities are really smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. There are as many diving facilities today as there were 10 years ago, almost to the one. The reality is they're not where they used to be. Most of our diving facilities were actually based in London. They're not now. They're actually based outside London. We have fantastic diving facilities in this country. Some of the world's best diving facilities will be in Edinburgh and London. And you look at yourself at all the great diving facilities we've got. Now, do we need more? That's a good question. In my view, we've got a good stock of diving facilities, but we still need to look at the map to see if there's any gaps in the map. For argument's sake, do we need some in the West Midlands? Probably we do somewhere, but we've got some in Coventry that are not used. I think we've got a more of a shortage of diving coaches than we've got diving facilities, because a lot of facilities not being used. So I think we've got to actually get the facilities used first and then press for more. But we'll always look at diving as an option when we're looking at a new pool build. But frankly, we're in a great place, much better place than we've ever been with diving facilities. We have a growing swimming club in Lincolnshire, but we simply cannot get sufficient pool time for our top swimmers. Do you have any suggestions? Martin Ford? I think we can help you with that, because I think if you look at our um, talent pathway and you look at the way that we recommend that swimmers come through what we can do is work with you through our regional offices to talk to your local authority about getting appropriate access to the pool. And pool access is one thing. Affordable pool access is another thing. And I think we can work with you, particularly now we're in the land of the big society, uh, we can get, come in and talk to them about how the voluntary sector can make sure that we sweat that asset of a swimming pool and can come in and teach children to swim and that they've got enough water time to do what they need to do to meet the challenges of that community. And it's a partnership and the club should turn to us through the regional office to make that happen. Now free swimming has ended, what exactly is the ASA doing to drive people into the pool? Free swimming wasn't just the only thing that the ASA was doing, but it did actually uh, help us to establish new relationships with uh, pool operators uh, around the country and it indeed confirm our relationships with local authorities. We have to build on those relationships because the ASA themselves, ourselves, we don't, we don't operate, uh, operate pools. So it is actually the operators who we uh, rely on. And we just need to carry on working with them. We need to try and ensure that the free swimming lessons that actually were fantastic and introduced swimming to a lot of new people uh, are actually seen as an aid to encourage new people to come, in, come into swimming. But l let me make it very clear 
that the ASA remains committed to uh, growing the sport. We make commitments to uh, Sport England and we're absolutely determined to achieve them. Well, the loss of free swimming was a disappointment, but it was inevitable. It was going to end anyway in March next year. It was just a wee bit sooner than we expected. And, and in the current financial climate, you can understand why the government took the decision they did. Our challenge now is having built a relationship with the pool operators and with the people who run the private swimming clubs, the swimming pools, uh, the David Lloyds, the Esporters, we've now got to work with them to change the way they behave with their customers, to put the customer at the heart of everything they do, to make sure that the customer experience is better. When you go back to the swimming pool, I want you to say, wow, this was better than when I went when I was in school. I want you to say, this is what I want to do. And I think it's really important that we put the customer at the centre of our thinking. The forward-thinking pool operators are already there. Some of the local authorities have got some way to travel on putting the customer first. They're all into bearing down on costs and the more traditional local authority approach. What can we do to make swimming in this country as interesting and fun as it seems when you're on holiday? I think there's lots we can do, and I think our job as an organisation is to make sure that every corner of the swimming community is catered for. We've got some great inspirational figures in terms of our international stars now, household names, and, and that's fantastic, Rebecca Adlington, Tom Daly, but what we also need to do is to make sure that the experience that young children get and adults coming back into the pool is fantastic and exciting and different. We can't just open the pools up and wait for Molly to come down to have her two-length swim. We've got to put on different ideas. Mini water polo is a great idea. Throw inflatables into the pool, have a fun session, have a youth club, have a bombing night, have all sorts of ideas. And there's, again, some pools are really driving on this. But, you know, it's important that uh, we, we really work with the industry to make it as exciting as we can.